Sweet. Let's go find ah. something else to cut up. Thanks, man. All right, take care. Rick, I said I'd come back with some more intriguing Viking items. All come right. Around. Come around. Put them right here. Moments like these remind me of how much I love my job. Most people, especially here in the United States, never get to see a real Viking sword in person. But Laird is willing to let me look at two of them that he has in his collection. And to a history nerd like me, there's nothing cooler. What I've got here for you is some classic uh, Viking swords. Cool. We've got one that's classic from the pre-Christian era, decorated with silver and copper and yellow, which is, it's rare for it to survive, because a lot of times the Vikings, when they put their dead into graves, they burn them first. And they often burn the items with them. So silver, copper often just melted right off, and you're just left with the iron. Can I? Yes, certainly. All right. This was a lot of work, a lot of skill. We're talking, mm. what, like 880? That one's probably closer to 950. Okay, but still, I mean, there wasn't a whole lot of technology, and most people don't realize how difficult iron is to work with. And, and, and what we don't realize is that it took a lot of effort to turn iron into steel. So they get the carbon in to make the edge actually hard. On this one, it's a special item because it's after the conversion to Christianity. It's around 1050 AD. This sword actually was published in an article that studied the carbon content of steel on a number of swords. It was about eight tenths of a percent, which we don't think of as high today. But back then, very, very high. And this one is actually inscribed. And what you can see, I'm not gonna stab you, but uh, this one uh, has the name Niso, and then it's followed by the Latin phrase, me fecit, which simply means Niso made me. Okay, that is definitely cool. When you think about a Viking sword and, and what it meant to the owner, it was a signal of differentiation and wealth and power within the Viking society. We can almost think about it today like, uh, the difference between, you know, a gentleman driving a Dodge Neon and a gentleman driving uh, a Mercedes S-Class. These are pretty damn amazing. So you're looking to maybe sell these things? I haven't, I haven't actually sold a sword from the collection since probably 2006. The prices tend to be pretty high because they don't come up that often. They're both something in the $35,000 to, to $40,000 range. Okay. Um... It's a great piece of history. It really is. But out of my league for most of my customers, you wouldn't sell me one for like half that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'd love to be able to do that, but uh, I don't think I could ever replace it. I understand. You know, um, hopefully you'll go broke one day, though, man. I'm working on it. I'm working on it. <laughs> All right, man. Well, thanks for showing it to me. Thank you, Rick. Good to see you. Rick's quite a businessman. Sometime in the future, it's always possible that Rick could uh, pry one out of my hands, but uh, for now, I'm, uh, I'm pretty resolute. Hey, Rick, my, how are you doing? How's my favorite book picker? Uh, this time, I picked a book that I think any businessman would love. It's Adam Smith's The Wealth of Nations. The Capitalist Manifesto. It is. <laughs> I brought a copy of an 18th century edition of Adam Smith's The Wealth of Nations. It's the most important book of capitalist economics, and Rick's a businessman, so I think he's going to go gaga for it. It's the first books on economics and uh, the capitalist system, what we call a free market economy now. They should study this in high school. They really should. It's basically everything about the creation of wealth. Like, you know, basically a man goes in his backyard, digs up some dirt, takes the iron out of the ground, and turns it into a horseshoe. So the horseshoe is worth money, so you have created wealth out of nothing. I basically said, let people work hard and do business, and everyone will do well. And the invisible hand, meaning the marketplace, will figure out the price structures of everything. Exactly. And actually, I knew you'd be interested in the invisible hand, so I put a little marker here just where it is. He says, he intends only in his own gain, referring to the person. And he is in this, and in many other cases, led by an invisible hand. And it only appears really once in the book, but that's the phrase that the book is known for. What year was this printed? This is the, a sixth edition of the book. It was printed in uh, 1791. Uh, it's still a nice collectible edition because it's still an 18th century edition. Have they been rebound? Uh, well, I think they retain some of their uh, original binding, but at some point, uh, the spines uh, have been remade to match the, the binding covers. So the spines are probably 20th century, but the covers are much earlier. It's a pretty amazing set of books. The nerd in me is going like oh, crazy yeah, yeah. right now. How much you want for them? Well, I was going to ask uh, uh, $2,500 for them. Um... 
As always, I'm going to call in Rebecca because she knows a lot more about this stuff than sure, I do. Sure, stuff. All right, I'll be right back. Cool. Okay. okay. Sounds good. These will look so amazing on my bookshelf at my house. <laughs> the Wealth of Nations. Oh. The Capitalist Manifesto. That's clever of you. Did you come up with that? I all came on up your with own? that all by myself. That was all you. <laughs> I tried to bring something this time to make Rick excited. Hey, it's about making money. That's like my third or fourth favorite thing in the world. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I'm showing Rick's cars when I say, I think he really wants this book. <laughs> You know, in some ways, Adam Smith is the Darwin of economics. You're in this sort of mercantilist economy that's very different, driven by these huge, powerful yeah. states. And 1776, you have the Declaration of Independence, and it's the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Things are changing. And this is an explosion of economic thought and work, and it just changed the way we live. 1776, the Founding Fathers were reading this book. This was hugely influential on Hamilton, and in fact, Madison later uses it to counter some of Hamilton's suggested projects. So it's kind of great because Founding Fathers on both sides use it against each yeah. other. This is essentially the most important work in modern economic thought. Any edition of Wealth of Nations published in the 18th century is going to be desired by collectors because that's still the same historical context. The same people reading it and being influenced by it and acting based on its principles. All right, so should we talk about the actual copies here? So there's a little bit of foxing. Yes. I, I learned that from her. I, I'm impressed. <laughs> That's the spots on the pages. Yes, <laughs> the, the spots. Yes, there's foxing on the pages. A little bit more than I would like to see, frankly. It's been rebacked. I don't mind the rebacking because it's pretty well done, though there are some other issues of edgeware to the binding. But you know, for what it is, among other 18th century copies, it's actually rather nice. OK. So what do you think they're worth? This is the type of book that's a total home run in book collecting. Personally, if I had this copy of this book, I would be selling it for around 4,800 to 5,000. That's a decent price. Thanks. Well, thanks so much, Rebecca, as always. So, I'll give you your 2,500, I, I, I think. And I'll tell you, it's no secret, both of us knew that you really want these. I, 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 I know that, I know that, it's, um, you know what I see, Rick? I see that invisible hand now coming <laughs> and reaching into your wallet a little bit. Look, why don't you give me 28 for them? That's less than three grand. It's the most important book in, in capitalism. That's an 18th century edition and a very nice copy of it, 2,800. All right, I'll give you 2,700 because you know I want these for myself and that sort of stuck that way. But it, 20, and it's more than fair okay. and next, just, next time, take care of me. I, I'm not going to argue with you for $100. <laughs> I think that's fair. That's Thanks, cool. man. I appreciate it. Rick and I agreed on 2700 I probably could have squeezed him for a little bit more, but, you know, he did boost it a little bit to make me happy. Can I help you with something? Hey, just trying to find out the, the authenticity of this meteorite. Whoa. So my dad was a big comic book aficionado. OK. And so this was gifted to him. It's kryptonite. Um, I, I didn't use that word. <laughs> I have a meteorite. It's been in the family for a while. It was a, it was a hand-me-down from the friends that I've talked to. This is the gift from the gods. I'm, I'm hoping he's going to see the true value of this. This is very cool. Meteorites are really, really neat. I mean, you can really nerd out on them. NASA is always tracking big asteroids. And actually, we're really, really lucky that we live on Earth. Saturn and Jupiter are like giant gravitational magnets that end up sucking up most of the asteroids that come close to Earth. If they weren't there, we probably wouldn't exist because we'd be hit by meteorites all the time. So it looks meteorite-ish. Um, um, what's this thing weigh, like 40, 50 pounds? Yeah, yeah, you're probably uh, pretty close on the mark there. Feels pretty authentic. They were just so prized by like all the ancient cultures because up until like 150 years ago, it was really hard to make steel. Okay, it was a very expensive process. But sometimes when they found these rocks, it was this incredible kind of iron that was really malleable. It held an edge, it wasn't brittle. It was just everything about this stuff was amazing. You could build things that no one else could build. Ancient cultures literally thought these were gifts from the gods. That's what makes it so cool. Mm -hmm. So did you have an idea what you wanted for it? I do, um, 24,000. Okay, um, sounds like a lot of money, but these are definitely collectible. I don't know exactly how much big iron ones like this go for, but 
I have a friend that can tell us, he can test it and do all sorts of stuff like that. Maybe the really big ones go for big money. For sure. I'll be right back. I am very confident this is a meteorite, but let the expert take a look at it and really tell me the true value of it. I think it's gonna bring a nice penny. What you got today? I have what I believe to be a meteorite. So, this is a piece of iron that's coming into the Earth at up to 100,000 miles an hour. So at that speed, it melts and it forms all these wonderful little depressions. And that's why they look the way they do and they get this little crust on it. So just based on that, looks like a meteorite, but my little space gun, as Red calls it, will tell me what we've got here. That will prevent you from having children. That's what this thing is. Oh, for sure. <laughs> so stand back, radioactive. So my guess is this comes from Argentina. So the biggest fall of meteorites in known history came from a site called Campo de Cielo. And there are 15, 20 tons of this material that's on the market. So if this is from Campo, we should see about 90% iron and about 9% nickel. So that will tell us where this guy is from. So I just point, shoot, and I have got 89% iron, 10% nickel. So. This is a Campo meteorite. Okay. So the Spanish found this in about 1570. They think this meteorite hit the Earth somewhere between three and 5,000 years ago. Okay. So I know meteorites are collectible, but what do they go for? Meteorite of this size should sell for 50 cents a gram, give or take. Joshua, do we have a scale around here somewhere? I think so, let me go check. All right. Oh, cool. Just sit on the ground. All right, so you look like you're in shape. Yeah, I've been hanging yeah. around this long. You brought it in here. Yeah. So what does it weigh? 19.7 kilograms. So you're saying it's worth around 10 grand? 10,000 bucks. Okay. Thanks, man. My pleasure. Okay. I'll um, take my gun and go. All right, so... Um, I'll give you five grand. Wow, yeah, that's, that's considerably lower than what I initially walked in here. Because you wanted way too much money when you walked in here. Well, <laughs> obviously I was going off of other, you know, recommendations. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. How about seven? <sighs> you know what? I'll give you the seven grand, okay? Just walk over to the counter over there, we'll do some paperwork, and uh, I'll get you paid, okay? Thanks. Well, we settled on $7,000, knowing that it is real, and my dad's hand-me-down really was a meteorite, brings some, some level of happiness. So I'm, I'm, I'm okay with $7,000. A Wooten desk? The king of desks, they called it. Uh, yes, the supercomputer of desks from the 1880s. Yeah, the patent date is 1874, and then this side is mailbox. They were purpose-built for organizing your stuff, and it's so much like the supercomputer. You gotta open it up to see if you have mail. <laughs> I'm at the pawn shop to sell my original Wooten desk. It was designed by William Wooten, and this one is dated 1885. This desk came from the great-granddaughter of the original owner. The price I want for the Wooten desk is $14,500. These are amazing. When Wooten came out with these things, it was the first desk that was like business oriented. It wasn't like a writing desk at home or something like this. You did business with this desk. Oh, these were very professional desks. Where the world was getting complicated in the Gilded Age and you know, to get organized, you needed one of these. Can I open it up? Yeah, go ahead. This is clean, this is really nice. Oh, that's great. It's in beautiful shape. A lot of these got fairly beat up because they were real commercial desks. But this one was in the in the single family and descended, and it was stayed in very good shape. These are all original. There's little compartments, and there's an alphabetical system and a number system for you know bills or invoices. There's the mail slot in the back, so when you come in in the morning, you could just open this and grab your mail out from here. Oh, I can see it's been a little bit modified, but that yeah. happens to him every once in a while. Right. Apparently, he had some sort of paging system put in there or something like that. And I'm assuming these right here were most likely for setting his pens in. They're inkwells, a red one and a black one. 
I, I mean, I really, really do love these things. A lot of famous people had these. I think three American presidents did. Queen Victoria had one, John D. Rockefeller, Joseph Pulitzer. They were really the prestige desk of their era. Um, OK, so how much you want for it? I want 14500 I'm in love with this thing. 99% sure everything's cool, but do you mind if I have someone look at it? Not at all. I don't know if they uh, there was different companies making them and right. selling them as Wootens later on. Right. Uh, give me a few minutes. I'm going to call somebody. Just make sure there's no problems. But as far as I can tell, there's no problems. So but give me five minutes, all right? That's great. I have no doubts but that this is an authentic one. I'm real happy to have an expert look at it, and I hope he backs that up. Here we oh, go. Wooten. Nice. You bought one of these new, right? Uh, no, I did not. <laughs> <laughs> However, they're interesting. The guy who invented this, William Wooten, decided he was going to build the best desk out there, the king of desks. And he came up with this. I love these because of all the cubby holes. There was, uh, what, 114 or something cubby holes in it. The desk itself is all made out of black walnut. Now, these are faced in probably curly maple. Much of this was done by hand, and this was not cheap in its day. So how much were these new? I think they started around $700 for the lowest end, and then went up to thousands of dollars. Whoa. You know, at that point in time, that was a horrendous amount of money for a desk. And looking at it, it doesn't look like it's had too much work done to it. This is beautiful. So. The reason I called you down here, it's a Wooten desk, right? Can we close it up and take a look at the label? Yeah. I just want to make sure someone just didn't take a Wooten label and stick it on this thing. Yeah. Should be letters on this side, yes. Oh, yeah. So looking at it, looking at the label, this is a Wooten. This one's just beautiful. All right, so, thanks, man. Um, not a I problem. knew you'd want to see Thank it. Thank you. Absolutely. This is a beautiful piece. Thanks for bringing it in. The Wooten desk, for anybody collecting late 19th century furniture, this is one of the ultimate pieces that you would have. This is a beautiful desk. Of course, if it were me, I'd take it home. <sighs> so how much you want for it? I want $14,500. You bet you'll take 12, right? Uh, I won't take 12. I think it's a, it's a really good piece. It's a one family piece. The condition's excellent. And even the modifications are interesting. So, well, Amy, what's your best price? 14,000 even. So, 13? How about 13,500? <sighs> you got a deal. Thank you. This thing is Thank absolutely you. amazing. Go right over there. I'll have someone do some paperwork and uh, I'll give you some money. Thank you. This is what happens when you get emotional about stuff. You pay too much. <laughs> How are you, sir? Oh, pretty good. Right. What do we have here? This is a telescope that I've had, and I'm moving from a house to an apartment now, so I thought I'd bring it in and see what you could give me for it. All right, you could have brought in a picture. Uh... <laughs> Coming down to the pawn shop today to try to sell my telescope. I was hoping to get $12,000 for it. Minimum between $8,000 and $10,000 would probably be my lowest score. Where did you get this thing? I got that from an old garage sale. Do you know much about it? Not as much as I should if I wanted to keep it. OK. It's a Carl Zeiss telescope, late 1800s. Was he the maker of it? Carl Zeiss was a lens maker. He lived in the 1800s. He made a lot of advancements in lenses. He invented the acrochromatic microscope, if you have any idea what that is. No, I don't. This just goes to prove what a nerd I am. Okay. <laughs> Carl Zeiss started making microscopes in the 1840s and quickly became known as making some of the best lenses in the world. And when the camera became popular, he turned into the industry go-to guy for high-quality lenses. Wow, this telescope was manufactured while he was still alive, which is pretty amazing. I can tell by the way it's marked. It says Carl Zeiss Jenna. OK. After he died, they changed the name of the company, and they dropped the Jenna at the end. OK. But we have some damage right here. The Zeiss name is still known for amazing optics. The company makes everything from microscopes to camera lenses to high-tech lasers. But to have a telescope made by the Carl Zeiss company when Carl Zeiss was still alive, that's something special. This piece might be a little beat up, but it's definitely worth restoring. OK, so you said you wanted to sell it. Yes, sir. All right, what were you looking to get out of it? 12,000. Oh, no, no, 12,000 is not going to happen. <laughs> no. 
in like almost perfect shape, they go for like 2,500. Wow. Okay, and this is far from perfect shape. There's a lot of parts missing. Okay. I'm thinking more like 800 bucks. Well, no. Nah. Can you go say 1,200 then? From uh, I'll tell you, what, I'll go a thousand bucks on it. I'm gonna have to have this piece right here machine. That's gonna cost me a few hundred bucks by itself. Okay, I'll tell you what. I'll take the thousand dollars. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks. Let's go do some paperwork. I settled on a thousand dollars. I was gonna think about bringing it back home with me, but my wife would probably kill me. So it'd be easier just to get rid of it now and accept the money. Oh, we have a hit and miss. Right on. Okay. It's a genuine hit and miss. Now, I think it was the uh, salesman sample as he went from farm to farm to sell these things. Okay, so we got the belt on here. Do you mind if I take this out? Because that's a little creepy. All right, <laughs> I'll put that over there. Yeah, that, that's just weird. My kids have absolutely no appreciation for the wonders and mysteries of hit and miss engines. And so I'm going to sell this machine instead of them saying, what's this piece of junk? It's just a principle of the thing. This was like the first gasoline motor that was commercially used. They started making these in the late 1890s. Farmers absolutely loved these things. Yeah. Because you can get a two and a half horsepower motor that only weighed like 500 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> the same size steam engine weighed close to 1,000. Yeah. And with those steam engines, they took so much fuel. And these things were massively efficient, and I'm surprised they don't use some of this technology today in cars. I agree. Because once this thing's at speed and then cruising along with these big flywheels, all the gas turns off, yeah. and it just coasts until you need more power. Really super simple design. You have a battery that goes to a coil, and it builds up a charge to like 20,000 volts. And when this spins around to the right spot, right there, it goes boom, and it goes pop. You do know about these, don't Yeah, you? and the neat thing, yeah, it was called a hit and miss because it wasn't like a regular gasoline engine that goes dang, this went pop, 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 pop. It was, controls the RPMs that way. Yeah, so, um, can we fire it up? We can fire it up. <laughs> <laughs> It only needs to fire to keep it idling right. Once it got up to speed, it would lock in and keep the exhaust valve open. And since the exhaust valve was open, there was no vacuum to suck fuel in it. And then it would just cruise along and coast. Just nerd, I mean, this is nerd heaven right here. <laughs> I love this machine. It's not every day that you get to see simple machines like this, given how far technology has taken us but there's not a whole lot of people that come into a pawn shop looking for a hit and miss engine. Well, I'm telling you, you got it running great, but I really doubt if it's a salesman sample. You can buy this exact same model online right now. You're kidding. I'm no. sorry, I, I didn't I, know that, okay. Okay, but do, do you know how much these completed models cost? I have the faintest idea. Around $3,500. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's a brand new one, though. But it, um, it has seen some Oh, but oh, that gives it's, it's, it's been road hard, and don't tell me it gives a character. <laughs> <laughs> Took the words out of my mouth. Okay. Okay. I would like to pay a fifteen hundred bucks for it. It's far from a new model, and I look. I need to resell it. Okay. Uh, you do have overhead. I'm aware of that. And can we move your like up to two thousand? <sighs> I think we can meet in the middle at like seventeen fifty. That's not fair, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what, I'll give you 1800 I think that's more than a fair price. OK. All right. If you think it's fair, then that's that's LBA. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, thanks a lot, man. Um, let's go do some paperwork. I feel that he was really happy to have it, and maybe I priced it too low. But I am glad to see that somebody appreciated it got it, because I think that's going to go home with him. Hey, how's it going? Hey there. I have a authentic sign, Dan Fouch jersey. OK. This is the greatest quarterback of all time, period. And I know there's a million people that argue with me, but I really don't care. I grew up in San Diego. <laughs> <laughs> I picked up this jersey about 10 years ago at a sports memorabilia shop in San Diego. I think Dan Fouts is one of the most underrated quarterbacks in NFL history. I'm going to ask $500 for the jersey. I'm not really sure what it's worth. Maybe a little less. We'll see. 
I grew up right down the street from the stadium. He was my idol as a kid. I mean, he really was. Me and my friends, we weren't the best of kids in the world, OK? Me and my buddy, we had a paper route. And occasionally, for a little extra money, we'd stop by the 7-Eleven. We'd put 50 cents in the machine. We'd take all the papers out and set them right there on the sidewalk in front of 7-Eleven. And we'd sell them for 50 cents a piece. And lo and behold, Dad Fouts went by once and bought a newspaper office. And uh, it was just like the highlight of the year. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> I was, I think, 13 or 14 years old, and he was cool to me, and I remember it to this day. Absolutely. If he was playing today, Dan Fouts would be one of the best quarterbacks in the league, no question. This guy threw for over 4,000 yards three years in a row. As far as quarterbacks go, I can't think of one that was ever better. Gosh, that is one blobby signature. If you didn't know who Dan Fouts was, would you be able to read that? I know it's real. How much you want for it? And we can start around 500. Um, you have to realize, I'm telling you, of all the jerseys you find out there, especially on the internet, and a lot of sports shops, 90% mm -hmm. of them are fake. I would like someone to look at it. I got a buddy, he works right down the street. He's got a sports shop. Let me get him down here real quick. He'll look at the signature. If it's legit, we'll talk price, OK? All right, thank you. Be right back. I believe the signature on the jersey is authentic, and I welcome him bringing in any expert uh, he may choose to do so. Rick, what's going on, man? I'm just living the dream, looking at like the greatest quarterback there ever was. <laughs> greatest quarterback in the history of football, debatable. Best quarterback statistically in the late 70s, early 80s, I'll give you that, man. I mean, there was nobody better than Dan Faust in that four-year span. OK. This was arguably the best offense ever assembled not to win an NFL championship. So, you know, for a Chargers fan, you don't really have a lot of historically great things that happen to root for. So you're looking at the late 70s, early 80s. This was the time to be a Chargers fan. Well, yeah, a lot of my buddies say, what's the smallest building in the world? The Chargers Hall of Fame. <laughs> 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 you got to understand, I mean, when Dan Fouts came to the team, they were a losing franchise. Dan Fouts was the prolific passer of that time. On average, their offense would put up about 30 points per game, which is just unheard of back then, when the game usually focused on defense and running. I just want to make sure it's legit. OK. This is what I have here. This is from PSA's website directly. This is an example of a Dan Fouts signature. So what I'd like to do, we'll turn it over, we'll compare the two, the characteristics of the autograph, and I'll let you know what it is. OK. The signature is really, really blobby. Ah, the old paint pen, yeah. Looking at a Dan Fouts signature, you just want to focus on a couple of the key characteristics. It's a very small, compact signature, starting with the D and Dan. All of his signatures I've seen, it's a pair of stacked loops with the top loop being significantly larger than the bottom. And then the F, that's the main thing you want to look at. It's a standalone letter, and the lower bar in the F is always going to be symmetrical with the cross and the T. Based on my experience, I've seen a lot of Dan Fouts signatures out there. Comparing it with the template, this one's easily 100% authentic. Uh, OK, sweet. So what do these jerseys go for? Unless you're from the San Diego area, grew up watching them, there's just not a lot of new collectors out there looking for damn fouls. You're looking at about 150 bucks here. OK. All right, so 150 bucks. Yeah, so he's one of those guys where if somebody wants one, they typically already have one. OK, well, cool, man. Thanks. Hey, you got it, man. Thanks. Hey, good luck to you. All right, good to meet you. If this jersey was game worn, we'd be talking completely different numbers. You know, game issued equipment doesn't come up for auction too often, and when it does, with a player like Dan Fouts' career, it would go for thousands of dollars. Well, you heard him. I, I, I disagree, but I'll give you 150 bucks. That's what it's worth. I want it for myself, but uh, that's what I could give you. I mean, if I if I if I go go get another one on the internet for right around 150, I'll just go there. I mean, this was just in front of me right now, and uh, just brings back a lot of memories. So, if you want 150, I'll give you 150. And I never pay people what it's worth. Yeah, just it... think about it. No one's gonna pay you more. I guarantee you. I'm going to have to bring you something else back to OK, well, bring me that. something else. I mean, if it's yeah. Chargers related, I'll pay more. I might but... have something else for you, so. All right. Thanks, man. All right, I appreciate it. Thank All right. you. All right. All right. 150 bucks. Sounds like the expert's a Broncos fan to me.